Thank you, Commander, for such a warm introduction. It's a great honor to be before all of you today. DAV is one of America's greatest institutions. In terms of serving those who've served, we're as iconic as any brand in our national lexicon. And in looking at brands, there are some comparisons we can make with one American brand that exceeds our longevity. By the time DAV members were driving Model T Fords to our second national convention, the concept of the Ford truck was fairly new. But to the veterans of World War I, it was something already very familiar and trusted. They were used as ambulances and transport vehicles by British and American forces in the European theater. But a newer model, the Model TT, marked an even more ambitious turn toward creating a vehicle that could change the world. It was a vehicle that could transport a newly industrialized nation and transform the lives of laborers and Americans of every stripe. The Model T's 177-inch four-cylinder could turn out a whopping 20 horsepower, which for a point of comparison is, well, 20 horses. With a hammer down, that beauty could go a whopping 42 miles an hour. Got 13 miles of the gallon in the city and 21 in the country. In comparison, the Model TT had a longer wheelbase, heavier frame, and rear axle, giving it basically the rating of a one-ton. It was durable and strong, but slow in plodding, topped out around 25 miles per hour. At the same time, American veterans had seen how such groundbreaking feats of mechanized strength could enhance efficiencies on the battlefield. Like the Fords that made it back from Europe, veterans faced a slow and plodding fight to find a new purpose after serving in the trenches. The Model TTs gave way to Model AAs, and then in 1934, Ford customers got a new treat. The Model 50 with its legendary flathead V8 shared the look and enhancements of the company's passenger lineup. But production of that vehicle came to a swift conclusion in 1941 when production screeched to a halt. America was at war. And like DAV, Ford switched gears. As the largest boom in DAV membership history was underway following the war, in 1948, Ford introduced the F-Series. Following the war, America needed more muscle to rebuild the world at home and abroad. Second and third generation F-Series vehicles followed through to 1960. Four-wheel drive came along in 1959. In 1967, the fifth generation F-Series featured F-O-R-D spelled out in block letters. These were the trucks that made Ford a favorite for so many veterans returning from Vietnam. With every passing generation, the trucks became wider, stronger, and more comfortable for passengers and drivers. We see an evolution being made an icon in the making. In 1973, Ford developed the ECU engine control unit, introducing microprocessors with 12 bits of semiconductor memory. By 2009, the 12th generation Ford was more comparable to the space shuttle than it was the original Model T. In 2015, to the shock to many, Ford makes a radical jump. Wait for it to aluminum, and soon after, electric motors. At one time, the idea of going lighter in a Ford truck would have been considered sacrilegious. But the change to military-grade aluminum alloy made the truck more durable and rigid. The F-150 lost 700 pounds, but it's actually stronger. It can tow and haul more on less gas. Aluminum is more recyclable than steel, and that makes it easier for Ford to create replacement parts. The savings is passed on to customers. Customers who hopefully are buying their Fords in droves using DAV's X-Plan member advantage. Thank you. <laughs> the point here is not to impress you gearheads in the audience with what I know about automobiles. You can ask my wife, when it comes to actually fixing a vehicle, I don't even change my wiper blades anymore. If I did, though, you'd find us using another DAV partner. And I'm forever grateful to our friends 
at USAA for their emergency roadside assistance. Thank you, USAA. <laughs> DAV's evolution over the years is remarkable. And if you ever have a chance, I encourage you to block off some time to visit our national headquarters to see how we've cataloged our existence. Comparing the timeline of American history with DAV's history, it illustrates very well how our forebears adapted to an ever-changing world. From the sales of the progress of nations and the adoption of forget-me-not flowers to idento tags and direct mail, DAV has survived the test of time by constantly pushing ourselves to be the best organization we can be. When we saw Vietnam veterans return from war suffering disproportionately from homelessness and disabling mental health issues, we funded the Forgotten Warrior Project, which led to recognition of PTSD in the DSM. And anyone who has ever been a service officer knows how life-changing that has been for veterans who desperately needed the care, benefits, and of near equal value, the destigmatization that has replaced shame and anxiety with validation. If we take an occasional moment to look back and take inventory of the lessons of the past, we must do so with an eye toward the changing needs of the generations of veterans we'll be serving in the decades to come. That is why I'm especially excited about the journey DAV has taken in the last decade. The DAV team I joined as an apprentice had a different energy and ops tempo than the one we see today. Our rebranding is comparable in many ways to Ford's dramatic shift to aluminum bodies. Though some of you, and you know who you are, are still getting used to the new logo, um, please let the record show I used air quotes when I said new. The effort that went into it has been transformative. DAV PSAs have aired more than 1.1 million times on television alone. In total, they've generated 67 billion impressions, equating to more than $743 million in donated value. It is an absolute honor to follow in the footsteps of someone like Barry, who under his thoughtful stewardship has helped grow DAV's net worth by more than $172 million. We've weathered a global pandemic and came out of it with a new headquarters that was completed on time and under budget, which was largely funded by the sale of two Norman Rockwell paintings and one by N.C. Wyeth, which were generously donated years ago. We are stronger now because of how we have maintained our focus on our mission. Not only was the rebranding a commitment for DAV to hold ourselves to a more disciplined approach in our outreach, it was a statement to every member of Team DAV. It was a gunmetal gray and night vision green way of encouraging all of us to reject the status quo. As Barry took the helm at national headquarters, the going mantra was that we would not be doing business the way it was done in the past just because that's the way we always did it. We would push ourselves for excellence. We would ask ourselves foremost in every aspect of our efforts was good for veterans. We'd be willing to take risks, but we'd measure everything we do and let impact light the direction ahead. We enhanced our collaboration with VA and the National Disabled Veterans Winter Sports Clinic and added the National Disabled Veterans Golf Clinic to the partnership to create an adaptive sports program. And that's without mentioning how we're looking into ways we can support the families of the fallen as they lay their veterans to rest. We're constantly pushing to create volunteer opportunities and leverage every available resource we can to improve the lives of those we serve. Less than 10 years ago, we added employment, where for years DAV had effectively promoted policy and government solutions to provide preference, training, education, and equity for disabled veterans. Today, we are one of the most prolific resources in the nation when it comes to connecting veterans with jobs. DAV cannot be all things to all people, but for the people we serve, we can say with absolute confidence 
that we provide tremendously impactful services based on their greatest needs. Where we lack direct expertise, we find partners who can help us fill the cracks. DAV continues to partner with entities like Save a Warrior, Boulder Crest Retreats, Joseph House, and others to support meaningful initiatives while introducing some of our most deserving and disabled veterans to the full scope of services we offer. And though we can all be rightfully proud of our accomplishments, we know letting our foot off the gas would undermine all of the progress we've made. In a matter of a few years, we could see DAV's membership fall below one million members, which is a landmark we've enjoyed for many years now. Though our membership represents the veteran community we serve, we have, throughout history, skewed older. Veterans do not typically exit the military and decide to join an organization like DAV, even when we've helped them. And in their time of need, we are respectfully hesitant to ask them to purchase a membership. We do not recruit at career fairs, and we never solicit for membership while helping transition service members on bases. We don't require membership to receive any service, and that will never change. But it seems, unfortunately, some of us are reluctant in other cases to follow up with the simple question we should all ask. When we say we help a million veterans a year, we say so knowing the number is likely much higher. But those of us who leverage the power of DAV to make a life-changing difference for veterans need to also leverage our recruiting skills to bring people into the fold who can and should join DAV. It is significantly cheaper to become a member of DAV than most organizations. We don't charge reoccurring annual dues. Though the cost is inexpensive in comparison, the value is equally significant and the benefits are life-changing. We will absolutely survive a generational downturn in our membership. But for those of us who want the legacy of DAV chapter activities to continue, as it has for many years now, we'll need to work together to plus up our ranks. We need to also redouble our efforts to recruit volunteers and report on our local Veterans Assistant Program participation. We need more drivers for our transportation network. At the end of the day without drivers, we know many veterans realistically aren't going to get the care they've earned. And we need more volunteers in hospitals and more young people to apply for recently expanded DAV scholarships. We have $110,000 to award every year to incentivize youth volunteers. We need help encouraging future leaders to participate. And as you'll see a continued and strong effort from your national headquarters to get more participation this year, I'll tell you, if you want a crystal ball view of what you might expect, from the first Iraq war veteran to take on this role. My goal is that you'll come to experience more of the same. Expect a national headquarters that believes in your mission at the local and department level and is willing to provide the support and resources you need to achieve your goals. Expect a DAV that is responsive to the needs of the veterans we serve. And expect a team at DAV national headquarters that understands the sacred nature of our mission and responds with the same passion and sense of justice that compels each of you in how you conduct DAV service in your community. This spring, we traveled to the Silicon Slopes of Lehigh, Utah to host a DAV Patriot Boot Camp event. The experience was incredible. We've hosted at the new headquarters a few times, but it took getting away from the office for me to remove the distractions that prevented me from fully experiencing. And I gotta tell you, it was something similar to what I experienced in the military. I saw a group of incredible, dynamic people with shared goals, working together to lift each other up. From our hosts at MX, a financial technology innovator, to the alumni and mentors who supported the event, we experienced the energy and hope that comes from deserving people achieving breakthroughs. And if my experiences weren't validation enough, we had a special friend joining us. Celebrity chef Robert Irvine, host of Food Network's Restaurant Impossible, once again was there to help veterans in partnership with DAV and his foundation. Though he is now an American citizen, 
He served in the Royal Navy and has incredible acumen as an entrepreneur. Here's what he had to say about DAB's newest program. I never had mentors. I never had somebody to tell me, oh, don't do this. And I'm sitting in the room listening um, in the first five minutes to information that I would have loved 20 years ago. And yet here we are, uh, and DAB is giving it to the 30 entrepreneurs that are already in business. Uh, and having talked to a few of them, this is gonna be such a spectacular um, event simply because they can grow by listening. And again, I didn't have that. And, and for, be, for me to be able to give the issues that I had starting my, my companies um, is gonna help other people. And I'm all about helping people just like DAV. DAV will remain the strong and undeniable leader in helping veterans achieve justice so long as we all remember the purpose that draws us together. I wanna to thank all of you for the work you do to make your DAV the incredible organization it is today. Keep up the great work you're doing and let us know if we can be of assistance. I thank you all. Thanks, Commander, this concludes my report.